Sabagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the holy one, the fully enlightened one, Sadu Sadu Sadu. Okay. Okay, so what we need to have happen is for one of you to give me a situation. You want to try, May? Got a situation? <laughs> Anything. Uh, I have something. Okay, um, good. Uh, like, uh, I'm new here. This is like my, no, my, my first uh, session. Okay. And um, it's, it, it's a really difficult uh, situation. Uh, I don't know if... Um, if you can solve it um but um yeah maybe let's give you a little bit of a background um, oh you don't need to give me a background just give me an event something, yeah um, something that occurs it's, you know it's 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 um a difficulty that i'm currently dealing with um so um basically what i'm like new to the to to the trim and to to the meta practice what i have like um a really strong background in bhakti, uh -huh. and um, I really liked like the approach of the six R's and um, that you focus on the matter and, and make it grow. But what my current situation is is that when I do the um, the meta practice, that I get so intoxicated, I get like so immersed in completely immersed in into the, like total ecstasy that I can't do anything like and you're and, doing it the wrong way i understand i understand exactly what it is okay um is that what you want to come out of that's basically what you what the problem is with the practice yeah so so ba ba basically what um what like for me like the, the meta it is like always there even if i don't focus on it it is always there also in the background but when i um, deliberately go into like it and and you know to 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 focus on it then it just grows exponentially unpredictable like when i when i say that between the dates like between like three when i say 10 it's like you have like perfect bliss and, and love and zero is like you know none then during the day if i do nothing it it goes like between two or eight goes like up and down but when i go into that into that hard space then i completely let go of everything, then it grows like really exponentially. It goes from- Okay, Ben, ha Ben, have you taken an online retreat with anyone? Um, no. Okay, that's one thing that um, I would like to do with you maybe. I I'm in a retreat now, but I might be able to spend some time with you, uh, let's see, from possibly, um, let me see, I mean, 30th. The 31st of December until um, 31st, 1st, 2nd, I mean, 1st, 31st, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, that's only four days, but I can get you started for four days. I can do that a little bit with you. Um, you know, first of all, let me ask you some questions. How did you, how did you find your twim? How did you get your instructions? Where did you get them from? Um, I was just uh, looking um, it up. Um, I was like looking it up on YouTube, the, the six hours. Um, like I saw uh, a video of, of, of Bante and um, then I, uh, I simply implemented it. So I, I already had like worked with like a concentration practice. Mm -hmm. And I just noticed if you were just exercising or working on your concentration, that there's like the danger that you like suppress things or push things away and i really liked the yeah the way like how the the six are, are, are integrated into it and yeah basically uh, during the day i'm like yeah um, during the six hours are you in germany are you german yeah okay <laughs> das ist gut <laughs> okay 
Uh, all right, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm sort of sitting in the living, in the front room doing this today. I'm in the, in the Dhamma hall because I have to keep the dog isolated. Um, let me go over a couple things that you can listen to right now with what I'm talking about. First of all, um, metta is not for the purpose of bliss, okay? Uh, so, and if you were working with concentration before, going the good um I, I i can't hear you you can't hear me oh, okay if you can't hear me no, you need no, to no go into where yeah okay um first of all metta is not for bliss not for the purpose of bliss Metta is a dana practice. The Brahma Viharas is a dana practice. When the part, I, when you were doing bhakti, when you were saying you were studying bhakti before, is it a concentration meditation? No, it is definitely not. Actually, the thing was, um, like I was able to um, to go into these uh, spontaneous, uh, you know, states of like a, a total total love, and that have the byproduct, which is like bliss but i had like really bad concentration skills and i was like um yeah the, the main reason why i wanted to train my concentration or develop is because i had like difficulties at university to concentrate and i was also wondering why i get into all these um uh, blissful states without having really good concentration skills and well, they can't get into the blissful states uh, with concentration most of the time. And they'll tell you that in order to get into concentration, it could take you up to five or 10 years. Yeah, but and, that, and, and in my opinion, I've been doing this for 21 years, in my opinion, when somebody has been practicing that way. Um, the fact is, this is a hunch I have, it's an idea I have from what from talking to many, many people, that if a person is, is practicing a concentration with a very focused concentration type of practice, the only way bliss ever happens is when the conditions become right. And we know now that the conditions are to lighten up the concentration. And so if by sort of accidentally one time it gets less concentrated, that's how they experience this but when you listen to them talk to you they'll say i've been working five six years i've never even made it to first jhana but let's look at a couple things this is all when we're seeking bliss bliss is not the cure you're looking for it doesn't sound like it to me okay yeah, like, it sounds like, for, to me like what you want to understand is you want you, right now you don't seem to understand what bliss is and what the practice was actually for and what you know this Let's back up a minute. I'm starting a retreat. And, um, you know, while I'm starting the retreat, uh, I, they should come in and listen to this. Um, you know, uh, um, can you ask them if they want to come inside to sit and listen to this while we're doing it? Hello? Hello. Can you ask them if they would come inside and just sit and listen to this so they would understand at the same time? I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone. We had people very late because they were late coming. They were supposed to have been here by 12 and things have gotten backed up. So I'm sort Maybe of off, off kilter. I'm off kilter. One thing that, that might be um, also like maybe interesting like for you to know, like um, for me, it's, it's I, I'm not like interested um, into bliss uh, i was mainly um interested in, in developing that's my, right so that's why i want to talk to you a little bit further first yeah. of all bliss, bliss is yeah. something a lot of people are going for bliss and this is not about bliss yeah what, like, like, what we're trying to show you ben is what was the buddha doing how did he do it why did he do it did he find something and can I do that too? If he found relief, can I do that too? And in the benefit of looking at to this this way is you go into it as a non-religious, uh, you know, way of looking at how mind operates in the human being, and you're going to discover. Um, how actually feeling is not emotion. Emotion is not feeling. You're going to learn how that works. You're going to learn exactly what suffering actually is, how it occurs, 
And the big one is when you under, learn what the cause of it is, the Buddha even found the symptoms of it as it's arising. So then you're learning to watch uh, the body, but you're also, I was just talking this morning to two of the people that are here and trying to explain the Buddha turned everything sort of upside down when he showed up. Everybody in India at the time, they were practicing uh, subject to object. So you're the subject and you have an objective and that's what you're concentrating on. Okay. And the Buddha shows up and he says, oh, look at this. The way to do it was actually to turn the subject into the object and to go to the source right here of the mind which is the forerunner of everything, of every thought which precedes an intention, which turns into an action, which causes things to happen, okay? And so he actually goes to the source of the whole thing, where when you look what's happened today, we hear about Vipassana, we hear about jhana, okay? But now we know that jhana and, and Vipassana the two were actually the Samatha and the Vipassana were actually two components of one practice. We also know that all the practices that have ever come into it concerning Buddhism were trying to get to the same objective, which they called Nibbana. And Nibbana is not a place. Nibbana is not like something we control. Nibbana is the absence of a lot, the abandonment of everything trying. We weren't supposed to be trying to do anything. We were supposed to have been watching. So it's an interesting evolution about how this all came about since they were trying so hard with these other projects, with using an object and trying very hard to concentrate on it. When they come into this practice, they're told basically to open the mind so we can watch how that distract you and take you away. So when I work with people that have lower grades in high school, lower grades in university, things like that, or they can't concentrate well enough to get a promotion at work, things like that, and they want to improve that, we try to look at how the mind is actually working. So when we look at mind, at the meditation as a definition here, first we say it is observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how everything works. Then if we want to refine it a little more with a few more words, we'll say, in order to see clearly the Four Noble Truths, and the dependent origination and the three characteristics very, very clearly, which will show us how everything actually works. Now, in some suttas, it'll tell us in order for you to get to the total opening of your mind, which means that you are opening up to the potential of your mind completely within the present time when you're practicing anything. This means when you're working on a subject at school, preparing for an exam, sorting out a dozen things you have to do in the office, or working on the line to oversee a whole bunch of workers in, say, the material handling department of a big corporation, and you have to figure out what everybody's going to do for scheduling, this can get really complicated. But if you learn how to do one thing at a time and your attention is only here and you follow his instructions, you learn what to do with something that comes up on the side or hits you from over here from the future or the past. So the second part, let, before I explain that part, the present, the past and the future, let me give you the second definition. So the first one was the meditation itself is how you are going to observe your mind in order to see how everything works by watching in every event that happens, every time something arises, how the Four Noble Truths operate and how that 12 links, uh, the actually show you seven links of the dependent origination are operating and 
how the three characteristics come into play. Characteristics are anicca, dukkha, anatta, okay? Anicca means impermanence of everything. So there's no reason to get uptight about anything in the world because the fact is nobody is stuck. <laughs> nobody is stuck because everything's gonna change and it keeps changing all the time. And even the universe is in a state of flux. You watch our governments right now, you watch everything that's going on in the world. Everything is in flux, which means it's not still, it's moving like that all the time. And then anatta is the impersonal nature of everything, okay? The suffering is the dukkha. So anicca, dukkha, anatta, you hear this in all the different Buddhist traditions, okay? Yeah. So the second, the second definition, Ben, is med the uh, that's the mind the meditation. Now we're going to talk about the mindfulness itself. The meditation became the Buddha's instrument to operate to see how everything works. Now the mindfulness is actually a type of observation, a skilled form of observation. Okay, and it's a skilled form of observation that you learn how to apply it. Okay. And the the nice part about the nice part about the the um, the mindfulness is that this mindfulness has a kind of memory thing inside of it. Okay, so it has it reminds you it recalls um, and it tries to help you to remember something. So what is it doing? It's helping you to remember that when something comes up in your mind, any form of distraction, okay? Any type of uh, distraction that happens or disturbance in your meditation, anything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or it comes up in your mind, anything, okay? When that happens, that's where TWIM comes in. And you remember, I have to apply the steps of the twin at this point. Now, one thing I do with a lot of young people is I say, it might be easier for you to think about this when that something comes up, you're going to train your mind to never mind. You're going to train it to never mind this. So you recognize that something came up, okay? And then you when you're recognizing, you're saying to yourself, never mind this, I'm just going to do what I'm doing, just going to be here focusing only on the present time activity that I'm doing, okay? So when you recognize it, you're going to be letting it go. You're saying, never mind, let it go, relax, smile, come back very quickly. This is like two or three seconds. Don't ever get mixed up about these instructions. Don't think that when I say let go, relax, it's, oh, let relax. Well, it took me some time. You tell me it took some time to do that. So then I came back and I started meditating again. Don't do that. These are steps that you're teaching your brain. This is what I want you to do. Whenever this feeling comes up of tension and tightness, where I feel like I'm being pulled away from what I'm doing on my desk in the present time, I need to, whoops, just never mind that, let it go, relax, smile, come back. That's that quick. That's what we need to remember about TWIM. So the recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat thing is English, isn't it? <laughs> It doesn't work in German either. It doesn't work in French or in Spanish or Yugoslavian or anything else, it, or Russian either. It doesn't work, you know, and over here in Asia, it's a very funny thing. We're saying these R's, six R's, but we know we need to call it TWIM. Why do we call it TWIM? Because we are tranquil wisdom insight meditation. So why did we do that? Tranquil is samatha, wisdom is seeing and understanding by seeing, knowing something by seeing it, knowledge and vision. We're going back to the way the Buddha taught. He taught you, you cannot learn to practice, learn and practice what he was teaching unless you learn it through knowledge and vision first, and then it turns into knowledge and wisdom. So, 
It's it's a tranquil wisdom insight. The insights are the same insights that you're attempting to get through the Vipassana when you separate it from the other practice, okay? But it doesn't usually happen for years and years and years and years. And this is because there's a misunderstanding that the constant concentrate. Now let's talk about concentration for a minute. Concentration is an okay word. The problem isn't the word, it's the culture that you say the word in. When I say concentration into America, everybody goes, yes, ma'am, right here, see? If I say it to somebody uh, like on Easter Island, or I go to the Pacific uh, to um, you know Fiji and I say it to them, yes, ma'am. It's about right there. It's just where it should be. And there's all these in-between things. It has to do with the cultural um, impact of competition, trying to succeed, trying to personally accomplish this yourself and make it happen. And all of those things are detrimental to them actually happening. That's what we found out. So in an example for you in Majima Nikaya, this is the middle length sayings of the Buddha that we use as our, I use it for my primary training because I was trained on that book first, literally. So there's 152 suttas in that book and 76 of those suttas, they have something to do with meditation. And then 22 of those 76 suttas, roughly, those are the ones that are the most valuable players for us to take them and to use them when we're teaching those 22. The rest of them, the excess ones of the 152, the excess, nothing wrong with them. They're stories about how he met someone and they had a problem and how he approached the teaching of the person so that, but he was guiding them to solve the problem themselves, which is what I try to do. I try to show you how is this engine sort of thing, this engine works by teaching you all the parts of the engine, but it's up to you to put the engine together and see that it's actually like this. And it never was like a mailbox system where they were all in individual places when we talk about it. So you have meditation now, right? And now mindfulness is to remember to always handle anything that arises in the same way. And the key thing that you learn from TWIM is to let it go. And the moment you let it go, you're not thinking about it, then you need to replace it. TWIM also is a trap. Okay, how is it a trap? <laughs> okay, um, it's a trap because it's actually called right effort. And this is in the Eightfold Path. It's number six, Sama Wayama. And the thing about the, the four steps of right effort used to be called the four steps of right effort, but now it's been switched across time. And I call this one of the slippages that happen. And you're going to find people saying one of the right efforts, but that's not right because this was a practice, this right effort, and it had four steps. So let's look at the steps. If we split it like this, and we have now two on the top and two on the bottom, this one was to recognize it, okay? And I recognize something is there, but just note that it's there. Don't no go beyond noticing it's beginning to happen, okay? And then you release. The un, these are both the, the unwholesome, release, see the unwholesome state and release it there. Now you have purified the mind. But then we have to do the other two if we expect any change to happen for us. We have to then bring up, re relax and give a, a smile. And both of those are, those are um, you know, those are replacing the unwholesome. Recognize, release, and relax. That's the purification. Resmile, okay? And you return. And when you return, your resmile is bringing up a wholesome. And then keep that going and keep producing other things that feel the same vibration, the same frequency as that wholesome. 
So you're always working in the wholesome mind states as much as possible. So now we're showing you what is actually happening, okay? Now, with suffering, we hear the Buddha say suffering and the suffering unstable <laughs> my internet's unstable what do you think ben that you're your um anybody what do you think uh craving is it's an i it, it is um geez craving is usually what they'll say to you is desire it's desire but if i do not elaborate on explaining what i mean you might think it just means i should desire nothing and that's a mistake because when you're living your life, do you desire to do well at school? Do you desire to have a good relationship? Do you desire to make things work in your life? These are desires too. So desire turns out this word chanda is the Pali word. It's a neutral word. It's, uh, it is uh, not this way or that way, it can be either side, depending on the paragraph where the word comes in a sutta tells you what they're talking about using that word, okay? But you're wanting to develop wholesome desire. Wholesome desire is to a good thing, to succeed in whatever you are doing in life, to be of service to people well in your life with a balanced way for yourself. Almost all of the teaching, well, actually, I would say all of the teaching in the Buddha has to do with a dana structure. Dana sila bhavana is the first part of your training before you can succeed at the meditation. Okay. So the dana means generosity. Why is he put that in the very beginning of your training? Like you show up in the woods to be a monk or a forest monk, but he says, okay, now you have to learn to live with people and you have to be giving and supporting and step back and help with everything working, not demand that it be the way that you want it to be, but work together. There's a, there is a good uh, description in uh, Majima Nikai number 128 from section 11 through 15 is describing how these monks were living together so balanced with each other. Roommates at college could live that way, five roommates at college or in, in a room or something, or four people in an apartment in college getting along really well from different backgrounds. That's where this comes in uh, as a very helpful thing in learning to let things go. Don't take things personally. Let them go. Relax, smile, and come back. And that's the way you start to function. So all of what the Buddha was teaching was to learn how the suffering actually works. And when he said that the craving, he, he tells you what the craving is, it is the I like it or the I don't like it mind. That is what the craving is. And the craving always manifests. It always comes up first in your mind with a change in the tension in your body. And you're describing that, Ben. When you talk about, I have this good feeling with me most of the time, the question is, do you have this good feeling only towards yourself and what you're doing? Or are you carrying this good feeling towards other people as well, okay? Because when we look at the, um, the structure of metta, metta is only the first um, part of the Brahma Vihara practice. And the Brahma Vihara has four, four pieces. And that's a good thing to look at, these four pieces in the Brahma Vihara practice that we use for your object of meditation to train with. They are causally related. These four are causally related. So the first one, that one is metta. And when you're practicing the metta, 
you don't just take it for yourself. If you take it for yourself, you'll burn out. It wasn't meant to be taken for yourself. That's like narcissism, all mine, nobody else's, just me. I got to survive and just me. But the trick, trick to a really nice, calm, progressive, full life is to learn that giving this metta to other people, even if you're giving your smile away as you're practicing it and living your life, you're going to get a lot back, a whole lot back from that. Some people could say that was selfish, but I, <laughs> it gets mixed up, doesn't it? Because if I give, the more I give, the more I get back. And getting it back is to feel good, to be able to give more. This is a um, feeding system. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I have, make a comment here? Sure. Uh, I think that uh, whether that is selfish or not really depends on the intention. Uh, like, do I do something in order to have like, again that comes back or am i only interested in the the, the, the betterment of, of of the other of the other person like um like my view is that in um that it, in, in pure love there, there's only giving there there's no grasping um uh, that, that you can like have for yourself it's like water when, when you try to 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 hold the water to to grasp the water you kind of like slips. That's right. Away. And but what it sounds like to me, and you can unconsciously be doing this, that when this feeling of metta comes up, if you go in and sit in it, get involved in it alone, it gets to be hot water, but it still falls out of your hand. You see? Yeah, like for me, maybe that helps you to like, to how like I just like got like developed, like, like I said, the, um, the, the, the bhakti or the metta or, or the love um, that, that I experience, it's like not the result of concentration, but it is um, the, the result of allowance. So what I did before I had was like a lot of people, they have a lot of resistance uh, in, in their heart. When, when things come up, there's a lot of resistance. And I was doing a lot of allowing uh, practice and um, I would call it use. Okay, to okay. The solution to this is that the way that you were doing it was as if the meta alone should exist and be worked with that way. But what I can show you is you need to learn to be working with the meta, training with it a bit of a different way. The meta, um, the meta comes from your heart and when you but the purpose of your heart is to be supporting each other in existence in this world. We say, well, why are we here? We're here to help each other. Believe it or not, all of us on this earth, on this planet are here to be helping each other. That's what we forget. We, we really do. We forget that. And we end up working for ourselves instead of for each other by working with a spiritual friend and it cannot, you know, you can start, you should go over to, you can go over to damasuka.org and go into the basic meta instructions, but please listen to the whole set of instructions. Do not listen to just a 10 minute version. At least the first time you listen, listen to a 30 minute version of the meta instructions with me giving them or with Bhante giving them. This is important. There are some shorts that are there that don't touch on everything you need to look at. When you're practicing, you don't move at all, not at all. You don't twist or turn or itch or scratch. If you have to burp or you know, expel gas or something, that's your body, that's fine. But you don't purposely move at all in any way or change your position. If you're not able to sit on the floor, sit on a chair. There was no secret in the floor. What this was about was sitting absolutely still while you are practicing. Okay, that's about the sitting position, okay. So you want to sit in a comfortable position without pain. Why? <laughs> because the Buddha was, um, has an actual progress, uh, four stages, of, uh, four levels of progress for his own monks and a painful meditation with with slow comprehension of the Buddha Dhamma, the teaching, that's poor meditation in his grading system. 
and a painful sitting with clear comprehension of the Dhamma is still, of the teaching is still considered poor progress. Painful meditation with slow comprehension is poor progress. The only one that he considered successful progressive meditation was if you were sitting in a comfortable meditation with clear comprehension of the Dhamma. So it tells us two things. It tells us that you don't sit with pain unless you really understand it's not physical pain. So there's two types of pain. If you get up and walk and it disappears right away, that was a meditation pain. If you get up and walk and it stays with you, you need to change the sitting position. It's telling you that because it's a physical pain and you can permanently hurt or injure the body, okay? Um, when you are working with your practice, you should always be starting with the, you're right, everything you're, you're saying is correct. You don't try to concentrate too hard. Your, our concentration is supposed to be open like this, not pointed on anything, not pointing to the metta. You, we teach you how to take one person and, uh, and basically start using them as your first object of meditation. And it's just your first object of meditation. And you take a person of the same sex, so there's no lust that can arise, okay? You take a person of the same sex and you start sending, may you be happy. May I be happy. Fill it up with some, you can get to the house. If you angry at yourself or something, this isn't gonna work, but it works very well if you start to send it to yourself for 10 minutes and then after that you start sending it to another person and you don't move at all and you remember that if you don't like something that comes up you don't do anything with it other than witnessing it came up and remembering it didn't come up because you stopped sending it to your friend it just came up impersonally arose when it impersonally arises you simply never mind it and you let go, relax, smile and come back. It's that quick. And you have completed recognizing it, releasing it, relaxing your, your mind of anything that's left over, but don't examine that. Just do this very quick. You're, you're sending messages to your brain and you're saying from now on, I want you to just let go of anything. And what actually what you described to me, your meta is turning into a hindrance for you. So we know that you're doing it. Wrong. Um, like um, it, it's not necessarily um, the, the meta itself, but the the bliss and the ecstasy that is the, uh, a byproduct. And, and but, the, but the, meta doesn't. But if you're giving this away, you simply give it away and keep smiling and just simply let it go out from you. The the problem is that you don't know how to shine. Right now, you're a candle that's trying to stay lit inside a bottle and it's suffocating. Yeah, if you light a big candle and put a big globe over it without any ventilation, pretty soon it will go out. Do you get a headache or you feel exhausted after you're practicing it all? Um, no, it's, um, I just feel, um, I feel so, I feel so good that I don't have motivation to do anything. It's like see, that's wrong kind of bliss. That's a um, destructive bliss that turns out to be a destructive thing instead of a helpful thing. And wh when you're doing your meta, you're you're taking it and it's like this. I have a pool. It's 120 degrees. I have a swimming pool with a fence around it. I'm going to swim in it and nobody else can have it. And I get such bliss and relaxation and all my exhaustion is gone. I'm not going to let anybody in this pool. I'm just going to get out, lay on the chaise and just, wow, trip with Meta. I don't have any motivation to do anything. That's because you kept it all. That's because you kept it all. That's what this is. And it's actually pulling you down as a hindrance for your life, isn't it? It's become a destructive force instead of what it should become. Your 
you should be as you're giving it to the other person and you're seeing them smile then when they smile it moves on to working with some other kinds of people but we can guide you to work with some other kinds of people like 11 other people then when you get to that level and you get through that level working then we show you how to work with the directions and then you're basically a very powerful meta uh, practitioner but it's not going to wear you out you know this you're giving it to all beings all living beings in the world but not through one sitting just saying i'm going to do that it's not like that at all you're actually building the power in the proper way so that when you sit with metta, then it shines out of you. And this goes out and touches the people around you. And it lifts them up and they want to know how to do it. And they learn to do it, to lift up, you see? By doing it that way, you don't ever... Um, it doesn't, it doesn't interrupt your life, it feeds you because this will turn into when you move, it moves uh, first, it will shift and it will move up into your head and it won't be coming from your heart, it will be coming from your head. Now, if you were to move this, allow to move this up in the head at this point, it could burn your head up because you don't know how to shine. So that would be like, well, um, lighting the candle and then putting your hand over it and trying to hold it and keep it lit at the same time. Can't do it. You burn your hand and you can burn your brain doing that way. But if you are actually um, learning how to shine it out just by allowing it, and it isn't learning how to do anything. It's tricky with language. We're learning to shine, allowing ourselves to shine. I don't know if you remember, I don't know in Germany if they had this little song, but in America, they had this little Christian song. It was all, I'm going to shine for God tonight. I'm going to shine for God. I'm going to shine for God tonight. Oh, right down the line. I'm going to shine for God. I'm going to shine, going to shine, going to shine. That's what I'm telling you. You shine. Then when you've given it to one person, you start to give it to different types of people, even the enemies or anyone that's troubling for you, you learn how to do that. And then after that, you go, and this training happens very quickly in like two, three days, four days, maybe to learn to do that. When you get to the directions, then when you sit down, you start working with the directions. And while this is moving through the other people and moving through sending it to all beings, what you're doing with it is you are um, learning, uh, you're sending it to all beings. And then, I just get my mind tripped. Um, yeah. You're sending it out to all beings. And then what happens is you are, it, it's evolving. The, it's actually developing in a particular way. So the loving kindness is coming from your heart first. Tell me if it's coming from your heart. Is it coming from your heart when you do this? Do you feel it in your chest? Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, it's, it's, it's um, yeah, like you said, it's like, for me, it's, it's, it's very passive. It's like not I am doing anything or like trying to... Um, I know. I'm not talking about doing anything. If it's in your heart and it's getting really powerful, did it try to move up and you tried to keep it in your heart? Did you do that? Uh, can you repeat the question? Did this feeling at any time feel like it wanted to move through your chest up into your head, but you decided to keep it in your heart? Did you do that? Um, no. But one thing, one thing, what, what happens is that um, it, um, yeah, kind of like, um, also like expands, um, like, um, but um, it's like, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to, to say um, much, much about it because what I noticed is once a certain um, degree of that um, meta's presence like uh, all the thoughts stop and it's difficult for me to to say much um uh, about it um okay what's happening is you're you are controlling it but it's it's subconscious types of controlling it's subconsciously you're controlling it you don't realize it all right go ahead may 
you had a comment. Can you hear me, Sister Kema? Yeah, go ahead. I think what Ben is struggling with, I suspect that I had a similar problem before I learned to swim. Um, and I thought for many, many years that I was in jhana and that was completely incorrect. I thought I was experiencing bliss because the body felt like it was expanding uh, beyond or it was always different kinds of feeling. And I was using what I thought was metta. But when I realized um, uh, through um, um, first learning through Bhante Punyaji and then after that um, uh, learning from Bhante Vimalaramsi and Sister Kema, then I realized that although I thought I was practicing um, metta, I wasn't practicing it in the right way. And it was like um, Sister Kema said, a, a form of concentration, I don't know how to really put it properly, but what it does, I realize is that, like Sister Kema said, it doesn't help at all in day-to-day -day life. Um, it just puts us in a, a disconnect uh, kind of, like we're, we're disconnected with relationships, we're disconnected with people. Um, it doesn't um, solve any problems in our habitual tendencies. Uh, in fact, um, I could be going into a retreat feeling really good. And then two weeks later, something happens at home and I get really angry. So yeah. it's, yeah. I, I don't know if Ben has that, but I just thought I'd share based on what he mentioned. I know, I know, I know that you've stabilized a lot in the last year or so. I know that, yeah, it's changed in the last maybe yeah. two years. Yeah. Yeah, I it's remember, completely, I remember how it yeah. it completely turned around. So I just thought I'd share um, my experience with Ben. Um, I can't be completely 100% sure if Ben is experiencing what I used to experience, but if he is, then I can definitely confirm that it's not helpful at all. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. Yeah. That's what she's talking about, Ben, basically is showing you how this can be a hindrance that's happening, you know, outside of the practice itself. And what um, I would like to see do is get on a track where, you know, you, you do a whole retreat to get all the information because of how we cover the information. Yeah, because we have a system of foundation information that actually is causally related to. Okay, and this information, you go with the instructions first, and the second night you talk about basically the hindrances and how uh, to handle anything that's disturbing you that wants to stop you. And that was something I wanted to ask you. Do you have thing hindrances come up? Um, maybe um, uh, to, to before that to ask like what before, because you thought that um, there's like some, you know, um, uh, I don't know, some, some pressure or control. Um, and that is present to, um, to, to, to a certain degree. Like I, I stopped doing the, the meditation like a few weeks ago and something similar also happened in the spring. Um, but um, like when I completely um, let, if I would like, there's always a subtle con control there because I noticed if I completely 100% let go of all control of all resistance, then I would get into into such uh, like um, like such like you're being. It sounds I don't, like I don't, almost. It sounds almost like you're being sucked into absorption, and then you're going through the bliss that's connected with absorption. It doesn't. And, sound yeah, like yeah and, and, like and proper I practice. noticed, and 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 I would, let's say that let's say that if I would, let go completely one hundred percent of control, and resistance, I I would intuitively know and and sense that it would, 
um, that that I would not be able to like handle all my responsibilities um, that I like have. As, as and see, this is what I'm trying to tell you. This is all contrary to where this is supposed to be going and what it's supposed to be doing in your life. Okay, it's supposed to be helping you in your life. And it's not supposed, it's supposed to be opening your mind so that it's more relaxed and it can stay in the present time. And you have 100% of your brain power and capacity. The potential of your brain starts to come into place. So it's easier for you to be working and solving problems and doing things one at a time and really working better. It calms you down. There is no upset or anger that happens. After a while, everything pretty much calms down. It can be upsetting if you get angry and you haven't been angry for like four years and somebody gets, you know, and you kind of get angry. You think, well, okay, that just tells me I still have work to do. Okay. And you say you're sorry to somebody. I know everybody's smiling at me because that happens to us. And you think that can't ever happen to me. And all of a sudden you do get angry and you go, whoa, I got some work to do here too. Yeah, so you say, I'm sorry and apologize and you try to hopefully keep going and, and work things out in a better way you have to re keep your precepts. That's the point of your precepts. You know your precepts, Ben? Your precepts are not commandments. This is the thing. They're not inter gonna interrupt any religious thing you do with God or anything else with any other religion, but the precepts in Buddhism are basically experiential points of advice that the Buddha had. You need to go in your room. Come on, come on. Can you put him in his room? <laughs> well, I don't know if he'll let you. Will he let you? Okay, be trying. He just wants to go in my room. He can stay. Um, where am I? Precepts, right? <laughs> this is a really funny film. Okay, the, um, the dog declared a moment of brief consultation. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Um, let's put it this way. Um, precepts are just like the fluids in your car. If you have a car, you have to put gas in it, oil in it, brake fluid, steering fluid, and um, you have to put the um, transmission fluid in it. If you don't have these fluids in your car, you cannot expect your car to operate correctly. You are the Ben model of human being. <laughs> ben model of human being. What the Buddha is saying to you is if you keep the precepts closely, the strands to you because precepts act like an umbrella and the hindrances come and fall down to see what you'll do with them. The hindrances are simply distractions that arise in your mind, impersonally arise, okay? You don't have anything to do with them as you're, when you're doing meditation. In life, they happen to. Remember that you didn't ask them to come up while you were driving the car or while you were doing something. But remember that you can simply use the six R's on them. And that simply is releasing them, relaxing any tension they caused by disturbing you, bringing up a smile and saying, okay, so you came up, you'll be there, you'll exist, and then you'll go away. This is the way you need to start. You, you can look at this bliss. It came up, it's there, it'll go away. Yeah. But if the bliss is decking you, and basically this deck, this is like a heavy duty disturbance that comes in your life and just decks you so that you can't do anything else. You can't say that's the result of what the Buddha was teaching. It's not at all correct because he was teaching something that made you very stable, clear in your mind, able to understand here's what he said in order for you to experience the complete opening of the mind he wanted you to fully understand see and understand the origination the disappearance how it arises and how it passes away the gratification how you personally get involved with it and the danger of that, which is to take you out of the present time and pull you in the direction of something that happened in the past or some worry in the future. See? Okay. And he drags you back and forth, these things, right? These phenomena that come up 
And he says, if you can do that, remember there's five of them, the origination, the disappearance, and the escape. It is an escape from anything disturbing you during your daily life so that you can continue working in the present time. That's what he's teaching you. So if you, Ben, what you should do is write me and you should, you should let me know, um, or write May a note and tell her your email. Is that okay, May? That he could write you and give you his email. And I can point to you, you know, I'm, I'm in a retreat. I'm gonna be starting a retreat right now this afternoon is where we're kind of running different time than I thought we would, but we're fine. And we're gonna start now, but um, these are people who are actually here. So I'm not running an online retreat at the same time. Uh, but at the end of the month, if you wanna spend a four day period or so with me, I can get you going in a different idea, a different direction that will take away what this is doing to you because you have to back up, see? It's an unconscious form of, of concentration that's being used here because you, you like this bliss, see? And when it comes, you, wow, this is nice. Okay, pour it on me again. <laughs> I, I, get, um, I, I, I get what you're saying. And like, um, when I was looking at it, like really with, when I was examining my, myself with, with self-honesty, I also like recognized that, that there's like, you know, a liking and, and, and um, a, a clinging to that bliss and I recognized that like this is not this is not good so I started to detach from the bliss and to just like don't um, yeah don't cling to it um, but yeah like okay now stop stop right there just what you said I try say it again I tried to just let it go, detach myself from it. Did you hear yourself say that? See, yeah. now I want you, I want you to listen to something very carefully. Majima Nikai number 22 in section 10, probably 10 or it's a statement that exists between the Buddha and um, I, it's not 10, I think it's like six or eight. I think it is. I never can keep this straight. <laughs> Maybe may you'll check in the book. It's, it's Sutta, the Alagadupama Sutta. It's number 22. And it's, I think it's section six. I think it is. And here is this statement. This monk, Arata, the monk Arata had a problem. He's a young monk. He's like a one-year monk. Their new monks are coming in and he's telling them it's okay for you to engage a, uh, an obstacle if it comes up when you're meditating. It's okay. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's okay. And the monks, the other monks know this is wrong. And they say, we have to go get the Buddha. We have to have him come and explain this to him. He cannot keep telling these young, these other monks who are coming in are hearing this the wrong way. They were upset. So they call the Buddha and the Buddha comes. And the Buddha basically has a statement that he says to him, go ahead, do you, can you read it to him? Read it to him, May, it's section six. And the Buddha, yeah. okay, the Buddha says that. Okay, you got it? So read it to him. What does he say to him? He first, he says, misguided man. And he's saying, you crazy guy, why weren't you listening to my talks? <laughs> he's basically saying that. Okay, and then he says, what? Misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them? That's all we need. It's all we need right there. So this is the lesson, an obstacle which comes up. And in this case, the obstacle is the bliss, heavy, heavy, dripping wet bliss. When the obstacle comes up, okay. We do not feed it. An obstacle can only become an obstruction in our meditation or in our life. 
if we feed it, you see, if you, if you engage it and engaging means what? Personally embracing it, embracing it. And what are you embracing it? You're saying, well, I, I don't mean to embrace it. No, but it's decking you. Basically, you soaked in the pool, you dove in the bliss. <laughs> you just sat, you're like there, I'm innocent. I just sat down and it happened. That's only because you've been letting this happen for a while. And it's going to take a little bit of work to straighten this out. But right now you dove in the pool, you drenched yourself in this bliss, you liked it. You climbed out of the pool. I'm not going to go to work. I'm just going to lie here and just think about how nice it was to just drench myself in it. Isn't this right? Is this right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, um, it, it goes into the right direction. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, this is like saying, because I know about Atta and I know about Anatta, so I'm not supposed to like or dislike anything. Don't go overboard with that yet. It's not time to get extreme with that stuff because it's interpreted the wrong way a lot of times. Right now, you're going to the point of liking. So what is, what is, what is craving is always manifesting, I told you, as a rising tension and tightness. So you're sitting and you start to feel this happening. Try just letting it go, relaxing, smiling, and coming back. But you have to be sending this meta to a person. You have to have a direction. You have to have an objective when you're meditating. You don't just sit there. Because this is the kind of thing that can happen. You're a sensitive, and that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but you need to learn. The other problem for sensitives that this kind of thing happen, you go into a relationship and you feel like when somebody feels something, you feel like it's you. You don't, you know, you have an altruistic, it's empathetic. You're an empath. Generation one of the empaths from Star Trek. Okay, <laughs> you are generation one. <laughs> okay, I have this problem uh, when I'm in front of someone and they start to get uh, energized in a wrong direction. I pick up the waves and I have to be aware of this. Otherwise, I put it back. That's how I fail sometimes. And I have to back up and say, wait a second, that was not quite right. And I have to readjust it. But what's happening is the bliss is, is doing this at this point, but this bliss needs to understand, you know, you tell your brain, no, it isn't time for that, but you've taught your brain to this point that, th that it is time for that because you've been doing this for how long has this been happening? How long? Tell me. Um, how long? Maybe um, a year or two. I don't okay. know. Um, like, but, so, yeah. Hmm. So it's a habitual tendency now. It's an in, inborn, like an inherent thing inside you. It is a habitual tendency that's been trained. You have used modif uh, behavior modification therapy says if we do this enough, that then the brain knows when you sit down, you probably would feel the thump from inside because <laughs> you're always doing this when on your mind. So how we retrain is we retrain this communication with your brain we have to clear up your communication lines with your brain because it's okay for you to have control in this way to train your mind you see and direct your mind and say when i'm going to do my work at school i'm going to be in the present time and that's what i'm going to do and that's all see this is all application i hope everybody here we only got into one question <laughs> one thing but it went so beautifully Ben. it was wonderful you know uh, but it, it took us on a journey of seeing how this is a fixed behavior modification issue that has now become a habitual tendency of the brain and it doesn't mean that you can't change everybody can change if you want to go and see the research on this, if you're interested in the research, you go and you put in the, uh, the Boolean the language, you know, the search language. You say, um, how do I change a habit if I'm over 25? And there's, a, there's some articles about this that they did research on. You want to change a habit to a better habit. They'll tell you how the brain learns. 
And the, the, they know now the brain learns through repetitiously doing same yeah. thing. And that the twim is perfect for this to learn to have your mind adapt whenever I'm sitting in meditation and I'm watching inside. If my body or mind start to get tight, I train my mind, let go, relax, smile, come back. Like when I fell on the floor last night, just let go, relax, smile, and go to sleep on the floor. I mean, <laughs> this seemed like a good idea, and it really was. I'm glad that I didn't try to get up sooner. Um, <laughs> so, so in in like um, in, in summary, you're telling me that like the main issue with my uh, meta practice is that it is not directed, like specifically directed, and as and well, that's just, only, I, remember, that's only, when I say that to you, that's, I try to tell you that we do this in stages when we train you. So we start by teaching you, like if I was teaching you to shoot, I hate, Bonte doesn't like me to use this example, but it's the only one I can really relate to. If you and I are the last people who can shoot an arrow and you're not very good, I, I don't want to send you to get the food in the forest until you can hit the target, Right. So what metta is about is giving. It was not holding on to it or letting it just bathe me. It was to help the whole world that he was teaching metta. His whole, his whole jaunt, his whole ride, his whole trip of teaching meditation was to show you how to do it the way he did it. And he did it out of compassion for all human beings in the world not for Buddhists, there weren't any, by the way, you know, he taught anybody who wanted to come and listen. How do we help people to get through living this life in this existence? How do we do that? So that we don't feel the pressure of it building up the worries of the future on this side and the agony of the past on this side. And we can't stay here because this is coming at you and this is coming at you quietly inside trying to interrupt you all the time. How do we do that? And he opens up a path and he shows you that it's simple to do. It's easy to understand, immediately effective, and you'll, you'll begin to feel in the just even two days of dedicating yourself to this the right way, that it is the right way because you don't want to hold all this energy. You're good at making this bliss. You could end up sending it to everybody in the Sahara that is starving. Everybody could feel it. You're so strong at this, you see? So it's, it's also hard for some people to learn that all of this whole thing was about giving and not just taking it. It's not for taking, it was to learn to use as an instrument to help all people, see? But in doing that, the payback for yourself shh, is really great. <laughs> you know, because the more you give to people, the more they help you and you continue having this life of giving and receiving and rolling it around like that. That's the kind of world we wanna live in, see? You see a man, he hasn't got a coat, so go give him one. Give him yours. Get another one. You walk by a guy sleeping on the street, he has no shoes anymore. Well, take yours off. You're not far from your car. Get in and drive home. Get another pair out of the closet if there's one there, or go get another pair of shoes. You see? It's just the, the world is stuck right now with not understanding what we're all supposed to be doing on here. And some people think we should just eliminate everybody. I, I think that's the craziest thing because you might be the one, you might be the one who will end all the wars forever. You might be the one or I might be the one who could bring peace to the world together. See that old song? And you want to just go eliminate people and you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea where people will come from out of the woodwork with an answer you didn't think of before, you see? So learning this thing about 
giving and receiving and turning it around and giving again and receiving and turning it around and giving and receiving. You try it for a while. You tell me if it's foolishness because I found it turned my life completely around. I was stuck under the weight of everything that was going on for 10 or 12 years. And someone said, well, why are you even considering what was going on? I said, what do you mean? And they said, you see this bottle? This bottle is your energy. It's for today. That stuff that happened yesterday, that energy is gone. This bottle energy is for you, Ben, for today. If you keep worrying about tomorrow, you're going to give it away and you won't have any for today. So take a week, write me a note. I promise you I'll write you back, but you got to write, send them to the Gmail. Don't send them to the other one, okay? And send it to May and just tell her the email. And then we'll take a look and come back each Sunday so we can keep track of you. We don't want to lose you. Something like 7 billion people out there. It's rough sometimes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Thanks. Um, I will uh, like uh, give May my my email and um, and yeah, I am. What is the right word? Um, uh, excited. What uh, like uh, yeah, like how that uh, will will change. Um. World always changes every day. Yeah. Did you know that nothing stays the same? There is nothing that is permanent in this whole frumpin' world. I drive from New York to Florida three days by myself. I told the teacher, I do not agree with this Anitia thing. When I got down there to Florida, I went in that Zen center and I knocked on his cootie. And he come to the door. He said, so how's it going? I found it, I said. Found what, he said. I found something that is permanent. And you know what he said? He said, what? Impermanence. Impermanence is permanent throughout the whole universe. Every grain of sand, every blade of grass, you can photograph it for days. And then if you look real close, it's not the same each day. Doesn't matter how you try to look at this piece of the moon, try to look at Mars, Nebula 2, the place where, you know, galaxies are being born. It's all changing. <laughs> so it was, it was just, we're sitting there laughing about it, you know, but it took me, I'm slow. <laughs> you're younger, you're probably a lot faster, okay? So I'll see you next time, okay, Ben? You write, May, and we'll go from there, okay? Yeah, Y'all, everybody I, needs to come back. I, I think we should float with this for a while. You should bring some friends back. <laughs> you know, I think we should float with this for a while and try it and see what else people can come up with, okay? You think so, May? Uh, I, I have so? one question. One question about the males, um, because yeah. like now I have like two males here. Like, which mail should I know? Why should I write you directly? Gmail. The Gmail. Conti came. Conti came to at gmail.com. Okay. okay. Use that one. Okay. 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 Ah, wunderbar. <laughs> Yeah. My German is so bad anymore. I just like, you know, I can't remember Kennedy from when I was young. Ich bin ein Berliner. That was great. That was great. The whole world. <sighs> Everybody thought it was great. Well, I did a little better than that, but I opted for Spanish. I'm ashamed of myself. <laughs> okay. I went out two years of German and two years of Spanish. So anybody... Let's say a prayer and then let's all think about Ben this week and have him try and do this, okay, and see what happens, okay? All right. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness.
May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect Buddha's pension. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I'll see you guys next week. Okay. Bye-bye.